a very warm welcome to everybody who has joined us uh, at this Human Rights in Action webinar uh, to discuss uh, restrictive practices um, and uh, future regulation and reform of restrictive practices in Queensland. We uh, are joined by an excellent panel of presenters and um, I have just done my acknowledgement, um, but I will do that again, the slides here on the screen. I want to acknowledge the land that uh, we're dialing in from today. Um, the, I'm coming to you from West End, so the Turrbal and Yuggera peoples of Brisbane, and I want to pay my respect to elders past and present. And I particularly want to uh, welcome and pay respect to any First Nations people that have joined us on the line. Uh, please use the chat to let us know where you um, are dialing in from. And um, it's always a really lovely gesture, I think, at the start of these online forums. We've had registrations from uh, around the state. So a really lovely way to acknowledge that um, there is deep ongoing connection to country and that we meet on stolen land as sovereignty was never ceded. So we're here to discuss restrictive practices. Uh, they are a method of taking away people's freedoms, usually against their will. They include mechanical, physical, chemical and environmental restraints and seclusion. Uh, so decisions like isolating somebody, using medication to control behaviour, locking doors to prevent somebody from moving around freely are all uh, restrictive practices. And they are a human rights challenge for us. At their heart, restrictive practices impact vulnerable people. They threaten human rights, including the right to freedom of movement, privacy and reputation, liberty and security of person, and protection from torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. And in sectors like education and child protection, the specific human rights of our children and young people uh, are threatened. In Australia, currently, there is no comprehensive or uniform legal framework to regulate the use of restrictive practices across settings and areas of life, across our disability and mental health sectors, aged care, education and child protection, especially in residential care settings, prison or other detention facilities. And uh, this lack of consistent legal framework is also true for Queensland. The catalyst for our webinar and discussion this morning uh, really is a, a reform options paper that was released by the public advocate uh, in October of last year, calling for a legal framework to the regulation of restrictive practices here in Queensland that can be applied consistently across settings, is easy to understand and use, and provides adequate protections and safeguards for people. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panellists. Our first speaker is the author of that options paper, the public advocate for Queensland, Dr. John Chesterman. John was appointed the public advocate in June of last year, and he had come to, he's come to us from Victoria, where he served uh, formerly as the deputy public advocate uh, in Victoria. John's worked in community legal settings and as an academic uh, and has published papers and book chapters on elder abuse adult safeguarding, access to justice, and the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Our second speaker is, is uh, Dr. Emma Phillips. Emma is the Deputy CEO and Principal Solicitor of Queensland Advocacy Incorporated, or QAI as we like to call it. She's an experienced lawyer with a keen interest in human rights protections for people experiencing disadvantage. She's worked in the community legal sector for many years, and the last eight of these have been with QAI, um, a specialist CLC for people with disability. Emma's the deputy chair of the Law Society's Human Rights and Public Law Committee, and she was a driving force behind the campaign for Queensland's Human Rights Act. Our third speaker is Jane Gelch. Jane is a mum and primary carer of a young man living with intellectual disability. Her son is a member of Queenslanders for Disability Network. And Jane works uh, additionally as a participatory process host and advocate across sectors, including in disability and in mental health. So I'm gonna ask these speakers to kick it off and they'll just pass on the baton to each other as we go through the session. Depending on time, we hope to have um, Q and A's afterwards. 
and um, I acknowledge we've received some questions already, so we'll try and get to those. Feel free to keep a chat and discussion going through that chat. Um, and if, if you have specific questions, we'll try to answer them and you can use that Q&A function. Um, if you hover to the bottom of the screen, obviously, we all know where these things live now. Um, all right, fantastic. So over to you, John. Thanks very much, Monica, and thanks to QCOS for hosting today's webinar and greetings, everybody. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm in Brisbane, in the CBD, and I'm meeting on the traditional lands of the Yagara and Turbal peoples, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Also acknowledge the expertise on the panel, and indeed amongst those people viewing uh, this webinar. So I'm here to talk about restrictive practices and the reform options paper that I released back in October. So I'll speak to elements of that paper uh, before handing over to Emma, and then I'll be around for questions uh, later on in the webinar. So as a background, and as you've just heard, restrictive practices are a method of restricting a person's freedom, usually against their will. They can include the use of physical, mechanical, environmental, chemical restraints, or seclusion. It can include everything from medication to control someone's behaviour, holding someone so they can't move away, locking doors, cupboards, and so on. Restrictive practices are used when the behaviour of someone is considered unsafe and there's a risk that the person may harm themselves or other people. For people with impaired decision-making ability, restrictive practices are most often used in settings such as disability services, residential aged care facilities, and healthcare services like hospitals. The use of any restrictive practice affects the human rights of the person involved, and without proper authorisation, the use of restrictive practice may be an offence against the person on whom it's used. Under criminal law, restrictive practices may constitute an assault or an unlawful deprivation of the person's liberty. And due to the potential legal and human rights impacts associated with the use of restrictive practices, it's vitally important that their use be minimised and ideally eliminated, and that such practices be regulated in a clear, transparent and appropriate way. So in the paper that I released back in October, I identified two principal problems with current authorisation processes in Queensland. The first relates to legal uncertainty around the use of restrictive practices, and the second concerns the current authorisation model. Just to talk briefly to both of those points. So on the issue of uncertainty, the legal frameworks relevant to the authorisation of restrictive practices across Australia are indeed complex. The laws regulating restrictive practices differ between each state and territory, and there are also inconsistencies in how practices are reported and classified. Here in Queensland, we have the Guardianship and Administration Act and the Disability Services Act, which provide a specific framework for the authorisation of restrictive practices usage in disability services settings. We also have the Mental Health Act, which regulates the use of restrictive practices in mental health facilities. Then nationally, recent changes to the Commonwealth Quality of Care principles have introduced a consent-based model for the use of restrictive practices in residential aged care facilities. This requires a restrictive practices substitute decision maker to consent to the practice if the person themselves isn't able to do so. Um, so one of the issues around uncertainty, as I point out in the reform options paper, is that this new national quality of care principles subordinate legislation is very confusing in terms of how it applies in a place like Queensland and in, a, and in some other states and territories. So in many states and territories, including here in Queensland, it is unclear exactly who has the authority to consent to a restrictive practice in a residential aged care setting. An attorney for personal matters under the enduring power of attorney and a guardian appointed by QCAT may have such power in Queensland. However, this is far from certain. So in terms of the uncertainty, that first problem I've identified in the uh, authorisation of restrictive practices in Queensland, the key area where there is uncertainty at the moment is in relation to aged care. Um, and I could talk further about that later on, should the need arise, but there is great uncertainty there. There is also, however, uncertainty even within the disability services area in Queensland, for which there does exist a, a restrictive practices authorisation framework. So the Queensland Disability Services Authorisation Framework is a consent-based model with decision makers, depending on the particular restrictive practice and the length of time for which it will be authorised, including, so these decision makers include QCAP, public guardian, private guardians appointed to approve restrictive practices, and even the Chief Executive of the Department of Seniors Disability Services and Torres Strait Islander 
uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander partnerships. While the framework itself is complex, the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme has added further national requirements in relation to the use of restrictive practices on NDIS participants. These requirements, which form part of the National NDIS Quality and Safeguards Framework, uh, and which enable the usage of restrictive practices and the quality of behaviour support plan to be reviewed and monitored, include those requirements to um, use registered behaviour support practitioners when developing behaviour support plans that include restrictive practices usage, requirement to lodge behaviour support plans with the Commonwealth NDIS Quality and Safeguards uh, Commission and to provide monthly reports on restrictive practices usage to that commission. Um, and of course, the rollout of the NDIS in Queensland has also resulted in the proliferation of new disability services providers who are all required to um, comply with this complex regulatory system. All right, that's the, so the first issue identified in that um, paper is the current legal uncertainty. So as you can see by that brief summary, it is a complex regulatory environment, whether you're talking about disability services or aged care, or indeed in those other fields where there currently aren't authorisation frameworks. So there's that uncertainty. The other issue I want to talk to about the current limitations uh, concerns the authorisation model. My argument that current consent-based models are suboptimal. So at the moment, in when we look at restrictive practices usage in disability services in Queensland, and which is currently applying to the regulation of aged care um, restrictive practices, uh, we use the consent model, which is a suboptimal way of regulating restrictive practices usage. So consent-based models require either the person themselves or someone on their behalf to consent to a restrictive practices, a restrictive practice. So in the paper, I don't know if there are three key problems with this, this consent-based model. The first one is the idea that the person themselves can or should meaningfully consent to a restrictive practice is frankly an odd one, uh, at least in the context of some restrictive practices. The example I give in the reform options paper um, is if you applied it to a person's freedom of movement, this, this model, it's tantamount to saying, um, to, to having the person say, I consent to you preventing me from leaving the building, even when I want to leave the building, which is odd. So likewise, the requirement for substitute consent, where the person themselves doesn't have the capacity to consent to that practice is problematic. So modern human rights developments are increasingly require any substitute decision makers, so someone making a decision on someone's behalf, uh, to make decisions that the person themselves would likely have made. So this means in the context of restrictive practices authorisation, substitute decision makers should only consent to restrictive practices that the person themselves would likely have consented to. And again, that just conjures up odd scenarios. So that's the first um, problem with the consent-based model. Second problem, perhaps even more significantly, is the idea that a substitute decision maker should be responsible for authorising restrictive practice puts them in an unusual and sometimes quite invidious position. So substitute decision makers are ordinarily put in place to ensure a person's wellbeing. People appoint attorneys under the enduring power of attorney uh, to make financial and or personal decisions that accord with their will and preferences. Guardians and administrators are appointed by uh, here in Queensland QCAP for similar reasons. While restrictive practices can be utilised to protect the person themselves from coming to harm, they are also uh, often times used to protect other people from the behaviour of the person. So requiring substitute decision makers to authorise restrictive practices puts them in the position of seeking what's best for the person, as well as making decisions to ensure the safety of others around the person. This type of decision making places a considerable burden on substitute decision makers who would in inevitably feel pressured to consent to the practice or risk the person, often a loved one, harming someone else. So that's the second problem with the consent model, the invidious position it will put substitute decision makers. The third problem concerns expertise. It's, it's rare for a person on whom a restrictive practice is proposed or for their substitute decision maker, especially in the case of a private guardian or, or a family member who's an attorney, it's rare that they would have the clinical expertise to identify other less restrictive means of dealing with the circumstances that have given rise to the request to use a restrictive practice. In the example I give in the paper is of a person 
who's appointed under their parents' enduring power of attorney and suddenly finds themselves being asked to consent to a use of a restrictive practice, for instance, a chemical restraint on their parent in residential aged care. That may be the first time that person's ever known about restrictive practices, and it will be unlikely they will have the expertise to think of or to advocate for less restrictive means through which the residential aged care provider might manage the behaviour that is uh, giving rise to the uh, request for the use of restrictive practice. Right, as to a way forward, in the reform options paper, I argued that Queensland needs a legal framework for the authorisation of restrictive practices that reduces and ideally eliminates the use of restrictive practice, practices, is easy to understand and provides adequate protections and safeguards and can be applied consistently across settings. I list a number of key principles, objectives and requirements that such an authorisation framework uh, would have. I won't go through all of those here, I can do that later on. My proposed solution to the challenge of this regulating restrictive practices is the adoption of a senior practitioner model, which operates using what I'd call authorisation rather than consent, and which could be applied across various settings. The senior practitioner would ideally exist as part of a government agency or commission and would possess the necessary expertise to appropriately assess positive behaviour support plans and oversee the use of restrictive practices. Transparency and accountability also constitute key components of that framework, which would involve the senior practitioner having reporting requirements as well as appropriate internal and external mechanisms through which authorisation decisions could be appealed, probably ideally to QCAT. This model could and ideally should operate consistently across multiple settings, including disability services, residential aged care settings, and healthcare. It also has the potential down the track to be applied in other contexts, including in educational residential settings for children, including out of home residential uh, care. Uh, it's anticipated that the framework would streamline the authorisation process for service providers, as well as reducing the complexity of the current system that does exist for disability services, which sees significant pressures placed on key agencies uh, in the kind of the guardianship system. In addition to the authorisation of restrictive practices, of course, the senior practitioner would also be responsible for the provision of information and education regarding the use of restrictive practices in Queensland. And a key element to all of this, of course, is um, you don't want to just swap one authorisation model with another one. The idea is downward pressure on restrictive practices usage and ideally their elimination. That has to be key in any new authorisation model. Now, since releasing um, that reform options paper, a Queensland review of restrictive practices authorisation in disability services has begun. And it's clear that this review relates only to disability services. And in my view, it's, it's good at least for us to start there. And a very good background paper has been released called Reforming Queensland's Authorisation Framework for the Use of Restrictive Practices in NDIS and particular disability service settings options for reshaping part six of the Disability Services Act. Uh, that's a 35 page document. I encourage people to read that if they haven't looked at it already. So that's a process that is currently underway and a senior practitioner model is pretty clearly indicated to be a possible way forward for the reform of disability services in Queensland. As I say, that's a process that currently is, is underway that um, I'm quite excited about. It doesn't go beyond disability services at the moment, but as I say, uh, reform there would be a very good start. That's all I wanted to say by way of my, my introductory comments. I'll hand straight over to Emma from QAI, who will pick up the baton and provide her presentation, and then we'll be engaging with questions and uh, comments later on in the webinar. Thanks, Emma. Thanks very much, John. Before I begin, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. For me, at my office here in South Brisbane, they're the Turrbal and Yagara peoples as well. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge our first people with disability, the intersectional disadvantage they face and the human rights violations they've experienced and continue to experience, including through the application of restrictive practices. Thanks very much to QCAS for convening this very relevant forum and inviting me to be part of it. Um, I'd like also um, to thank my esteemed panel members um, and to thank and commend to John, our public advocate, for tabling the options he has for some much needed reform in this area. So today I'm going to speak about um, taking a human rights respecting approach to restrictive practices reform. 
I'm going to touch on why the use of restrictive practices on people with disability is an important human rights issue, why the impact of restrictive practices is so significant and why restrictive practices don't work. So in short, why there's an urgent need for reform in this area before outlining some key considerations for this reform. So to situate the use of restrictive practices on people with disability as a human rights issue, QAI has always taken the perspective that this is so. Yet the conclusion that the use of restrictive practices is a human rights issue for people with disability has taken some time to gain traction. And I think this is for a few reasons. Firstly, it's because of the lack of understanding around what restrictive practices are, which can at least partly be explained by the technical language we use to describe them. We speak of chemical restraint rather than medicating or drugging a person. We speak of seclusion rather than solitary confinement. We speak of physical or mechanical restraint rather than coercion or assault. It's also because the places where restrictive practices are used are often closed environments, specialist disability accommodation, forensic disability services, locked wards of mental health services. In such environments, it's very easy for the people and the practices to fly under the radar. And finally, I think it's because people with disability have been largely invisible within human rights discourse. Happily, this is changing. It was given a significant boost by the drafting of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I think human rights for people with disability are now clearly on the international, national and, and state agendas that the use of restrictive practices on people with disability is an important human rights issue is also no longer novel. Um, at an international level, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendez, has previously called for an absolute ban on all coercive and non-consensual measures, including restraint and solitary confinement of people with psychological or intellectual disabilities in all places of, of deprivation of liberty, including psychiatric and social care institutions, finding that solitary um, confinement seclusion on a person with disability constitutes cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and that if used for prolonged periods is torture. Within Australia, the need to focus on the reduction and elimination of restrictive practices is also now well accepted. And we've seen the development um, of the national framework for reducing and eliminating the use of restrictive practices in the disability sector, developed as an interim step um, pending the establishment of the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework and initiatives, particularly in the mental health sector, including the national plan for reducing harm of 2005 and, and the national principles more recently. However, there unfortunately remains a really significant gap between this policy position and the laws and practices around using restrictive practice. In terms of the impact of restrictive practices, we have a genuine cause for concern. And it's not only the practices themselves, it's a lack of understanding of the factors leading to their use and the human rights that are violated in this space. While research in the area remains limited, we do know that challenging behaviours, as they're called, that are exhibited by a person with intellectual, cognitive or psychosocial disability are the result of environmental factors and therefore that changing systems, services and the environment should be the starting point for changing behaviour. As Philip French, um, a preeminent disability rights scholar, has noted, Queensland laws around restrictive practices have been based on the assumption that people with disability can and ought to change their behaviour rather than locating the problems encountered by persons with behaviours of concern in the environment in which they're placed. So it's incorrectly focusing on the, on the individual rather than their environment. Also, the use of restrictive practices does not always align with the purported aim of responding to behaviours of concern, but rather they're frequently used as a form of coercion, control, discipline, punishment, sedation. If used on people without disability, these practices can constitute breaches of our criminal laws, including assaults and unlawful deprivations of liberty. The Australian Law Reform Commission has identified that the use of restrictive practices can amount to abuse and flagged that deficiencies in the regulation of restrictive practices is a significant human rights issue in Australia. While those findings were directed at elder abuse, they're equally applicable in my mind for persons with disability. And we also know that the use of restrictive practices doesn't work. In fact, research has shown a lack of evidence supporting the effectiveness of chemical restraints for people with an intellectual disability. Uh, in one study, a placebo group rather than a group on antipsychotics um, showed the most positive change in behaviour. Um, indeed, research has shown that overall there's very um, weak evidence in favour of chemical restraint um, for controlling behaviours of concern such as aggression. 
In terms of restrictive practices more broadly, uh, we know that restrictive practices do not lead to a reduction in the occurrences of behaviours of concern, except in the very immediate term, for example, while someone's actually restrained. And the National Mental Health Commission review of 2015 found that there's been no randomised studies which evaluate the value of seclusion or restraint in people with a serious mental illness. So we're really lacking proper rigorous evidence of whether restrictive practices work at all. And yet there's a growing body of evidence establishing their harm. Research on the use of restrictive practices on children in Australian respite services um, found that the use of restrictive practices adversely impacted their psychosocial adjustment and re-traumatised a very vulnerable group of children and young people, thus increasing the family's need for further respite over time and increasing both the psychological and economic burden on the community. And the documented serious adverse consequences of the use of restrictive practices for both adults and children um, have been documented to include serious uh, physical injuries such as asphyxia and cardiac complications and death, as well as significant adverse uh, psychological effects on quality of life and well-being. So what are we to do um, in terms of options for reform? Um, we've been really pleased to see the focus taken by the public advocate in proposing a new model for the regulation of restrictive practice. We also support the focus taken by the Queensland government in exploring options for reform. We think that reform of Queensland's authorisation framework does need to be part of a larger piece of work that's designed to reduce and eliminate the use of restrictive practices on people with disability, with an extension to other settings in which restrictive practices are used. As, um, as Monica noted, they occur not only in disability services, but also within mental health facilities, resi care schools, prisons. At present, the law and policy within Queensland and also throughout Australia is very fragmented, siloed and patchy. I think we really need a uniform human rights based approach. And in terms of regulation and authorisation, the regulatory approach taken to restrictive practice in Australia has been to focus on their authorisation, when and how to use restrictive practices and how to record and report their use rather than on actually preventing them. Restrictive practices are regulated by legislation when they're used by disability service providers and in mental health facilities and the Forensic Disability Service. There's not an equivalent um, legislative framework for regulating restrictive practices in other settings, including hospitals, prisons, out of home residential care for children, schools. Yet even in areas where they are authorised, the framework is not working. The NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission activity report for the 2020-21 financial year showed that service providers had reported over 1 million unauthorised uses of restrictive practices in relation to NDIS participants. Now this number was since revised um, to 994,595 and the commissions released a statement regarding this report. Um, and they note, um, you can find this on their website, the sheer volume of these reports highlights the nature of these practices across Australia and the scale of their use. Despite extensive compliance uh, action undertaken by the NDIS commission during 2020-21, the rate of the use of restrictive practices that are unauthorized has continued to rise. We need to immediately eliminate it um, some types of restrictive practices as an immediate response in the context of moving towards eliminating the use of restrictive practices, um, such as the use of seclusion and containment for children under 18, physical restraints, um, which are um, illegal in other jurisdictions, um, including prone restraint, supine restraint, pin downs, takedown techniques, and any techniques that interfere um, with respiration or digestion that push a person's head towards their chest, um, physical restraints that inflict pain and hypertension of joints or pressure on joints or chest, uh, misuse of medication and denial of key needs, constant and intensive supervision or not allowing a person to live in an accessible environment, uh, forcing a person to wear clothing that's specifically designed to impede um, behaviours of concern, um, and also employing psychosocial techniques that can impact a person's exercise and choice and self-determination because these softer um, methods of exerting control can be equally restrictive and destructive of a person's self-determination. Um, um, in terms of strategies to prevent and avoid the use of restrictive practice, I think it's really important to focus on the relationship between the person and their environment, including support providers, rather than on their behaviours as the starting point. 
we really need a person-centered approach, which focuses on understanding the person behind the behavior, including potential catalysts relating to their history, understanding how they communicate and any communication barriers they face. Um, I think Michael Kendrick's work exploring um, the ethics of right relationships for people with disability provides a good ethical framework for interpersonal and also impersonal relationships that can act as a safeguard. And adopting a supported decision making approach in Australia, um, properly adopting um, this approach will be really key. So rather than using capacity or incapacity as a threshold test, the focus of guardianship laws um, needs to shift um, to be properly based on the assumption that the role of the support person is to develop and maintain a person's capacity. And we need to properly explore alternatives to restrictive practice, emphasising genuine positive behaviour support, combining psychology with allied health disciplines, um, taking a properly recovery based approach, facilitating access to services and strategies, music blanket wraps, development of coping strategies, etc and supporting and encouraging family members to be involved. And I think that's a really good point um, to pass across to um, my panel member, Jane, who will be able to provide um, some fantastic insight on, on that issue. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, um, I'm speaking to you on Gubbi Gubbi country, acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of this land and uh, thanking them for their custodianship over millennia. Uh, uh, it was so encouraging to listen to both John and Emma, and uh, I am not as ordered in my presentation as they may be, and actually I'm just going to add a little bit in here that I did not intend to, just reflecting as John and Emma were speaking about the long arc of my experience with restrictive practices, from way back when I was a young woman uh, training as a psychiatric nurse in uh, one of the big institutions in New South Wales, um, which had several developmental disability wards, which were hotbeds of the most horrendous restrictive practices um, I think I have ever witnessed. Uh, so yes, and then through coming uh, a, a side trip to Tasmania and then uh, some work there and working uh, in the institutions here in, uh, Queensland and eventually moving out into community mental health and into the disability space uh, after my uh, experience of becoming the mother of someone with intellectual disability. So what a, a marvellous training for advocacy for him I had. Uh, and yeah, just much gratitude for that. Working in disability service provision as the manager of a service provider that I uh, co-founded with another mum uh, and coming right up against uh, the use of restrictive practices and the introduction of the, the legislation here in Queensland, the Carter Report, all of those um, uh, movements towards where we are today uh, just sort of want to acknowledge that, that yes, as Emma says, some things need to change immediately and acknowledging that we are in the long arc of, uh, uh, St. Martin Luther King's about the arc of the universe, the moral arc of the universe tends towards justice. I maintain that hope. Uh, so I thought I would speak about what my experience is of what works well, um, particularly in the context of um, my son who is 32 years old and has some complex um, behaviors as we all do have complex behaviors. Uh, uh, so beginning from a kind of the framework that I think about this in or several of the frameworks, perspectives that I think about this from are certainly a rights-based person-centered um, uh, frame and uh, a focus for me always on what are the underlying principles we are working with here and to be in conversation always with service providers, uh, support workers, family and so on around those values and principles. Uh, beginning with a belief in uh, people's value, just for starters, um, our, our inherent value and dignity as human beings and uh, in people's capacity 
a uh, question I will often pose to support workers uh, when they are focused on the problems and um, the hopelessness of it all is, do we really believe in people's capacity for growth and development, everyone's capacity for that? Uh, and it's a challenging question that I also ask myself at times. So some of the things that I have observed over those many years of being in touch with uh, with uh, places and people where these practices occur, some of those hidden places that John was speaking about. Uh, uh, to start with an insistence on my part on partnering, on partnering uh, with family, with my son, with workers, with providers, with also um, experts, people, the people with expertise. Um, I'll have a bit more to say about expertise in a moment. So an insistence on partnership and, uh, and having everything on the table, uh, transparency and all of us um, bringing our different perspectives to bear on uh, finding solutions. Uh, one of the, just a little tangent there, one of the uh, frames I use is a complexity frame. This is from my other work uh, uh, that viewing uh, individuals as complex living systems who are nested in the complex living systems of their family and support systems, who are nested in the complex living systems of um, human society and regulation and legislative frameworks and so on. So what works at all of those different levels of complexity? And uh, one of the things that I have noticed and worked with over uh, uh, time in my other work is this principle that um, a living system will own its own solutions. So if we bring everybody's perspective in and work in genuine partnership and co-create uh, uh, the movement, the path forward with that person at the center, not at the center as the problem, but at the center as the person who is most impacted, uh, then uh, we can all be champions of that approach. So rather than an externally imposed solution, uh, one that is co-created by all who are impacted uh, seems to work best. Uh, support for my son, whose name is Oliver, Ollie, uh, to make his own choices and decisions. So this supported the movement towards supported decision-making frameworks and resourcing of those frameworks seems critical to me. Uh, Balancing tensions. So for me, this is uh, facing up to what is real. Uh, what are the real stressors on the ground? Uh, what are the real environmental factors that are, uh, uh, exist in that person's uh, world? And how can we balance, mm, I don't want to say balance people's rights, uh, although there is some of that, yes, yeah, so where we bump up against each other and we will have all seen this during the pandemic, you know, where is the, uh, where do we value the individual above the collective? So there is some real tensions around that and a transparent approach to that where we actually put those things on the table and have um, good conversation about that and take wise action seems to me to uh, work well. Another thing I would say is uh, skill. So some skill uh, for families. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, an offering, some resources, education and awareness that John was talking about where people may not have come across restrictive practices before. Uh, so that's one thing, although I do not think we can educate restrictive practices out of existence. I think this is requires a much more systemic sort of complexity approach in some sense. So um, some of those skills that I believe, or perhaps the foremost skill that I uh, think uh, is useful is the capacity for deep listening. 
listening to what is going on for that person, what are they trying to communicate, this assumption that all uh, behaviour is communicating a need. Uh, so yes, how we listen and how we respond to what we are hearing and bringing in multiple perspectives on that as well, listening to each other about what we are picking up. Uh, so yes, this partnership approach and deep listening to begin with. Just a couple more things that I know work uh, is uh, when systems are supportive and communicative. So when the families of the person with disability or the families are not having to do the work of advocacy across systems, this is too much to expect um, for living day-to-day -day life and for people, as John pointed out, who may have had no um, experience of this before except the lived experience. Um, so uh, yes, an expertise in its proper place so uh, not allowing, uh, so yes, what do we mean by expertise? So the lived experience uh, has its own value as expertise um, and cannot exist alone. Again, this partnership and co-creative approach to solutions. Um, and finally, I would say uh, where everybody feels that they are valued. Uh, the person at the center, the family is valued and supported. The workers are valued and supported. This can be, as you, many of you listening will know firsthand, very challenging work that confronts um, our sort of basic humanity in many ways. So yes, um, uh, and the roles of uh, the psychologist, the allied health workers, the senior practitioner, which I, uh, you know, I fully support this role. I saw how well they worked in Victoria. Uh, and uh, yes, so valuing that expertise and valuing everybody's input, perspective and uh, humanity. That's enough from me, back to Monica. Thank you so much, uh, Jane. What um, uh, what a compelling uh, presentation uh, that you've just given us. And thank you to Emma and to John as well for painting uh, the picture of this very real landscape of restrictive practices. Uh, listening to you, Jane, I was just thinking about those human rights principles that you so neatly unpacked the importance of transparency, the importance of partnerships and relationships. And I think what also really came through is the, uh, is the need for respect and respecting the complexity of uh, this, um, uh, this space and the, the importance of engaging as much as possible with families and also experts um, to co-create those solutions. All right, so we do have a bit of time up our sleeve, which is fantastic. Uh, there was a question that came through um, on the Q&A, which audience members will have seen. Before we get to that, though, there was a pre-logged question, and I'd like to um, invite the uh, panellists to address it. Um, it, uh, it reads, our restraint door is now open to all patients. Um, and it used to be locked for safety um, following a new management um, that came into play. So now patients can walk out and onto the roads and the, uh, the person has asked whether this is best practice. I'm happy to Thanks. respond to that, Monica, if I might, and then throw to Emma and Joan, if that's all right. Um, yes, I think, uh, so it's, that was a brief, um, question put on, is that best practice? I'd say a couple of things. Um, firstly, where someone is in a um, receiving services, there's a professional relationship there and there's a duty of care to ensure a person's safety. So there's a practice question there of how to ensure that person's safety if there's no longer a locked door. I guess, but if the door is to be locked, and this is getting to the, the need for appropriate authorization, um, then certain things I would say need to Happen. And just we just put to one side the fact that current disability sector requirements in Queensland don't view a, a locked door where a person has a um, quote unquote skills deficit. Uh, that, that's not called a restrictive practice at the moment, which I think is, of course, highly problematic as do others. Just put that, that to one side. Let's go back to this issue. So, if that door in that scenario is to be locked, there are a couple of things that need to be worked through. 
I want to see an authorisation process in which the implications of that decision to lock the door um, for the rights of the individuals concerned are thought through and weighed up. So I want that process to pose these questions. What's the effect of that lock tool going to be? Is this the least restrictive way that the objective, if it's safety, that the objective can be ensured? And how can we ensure that the freedoms that most of us enjoy and not living behind lock tools can be enjoyed to the greatest extent possible by the individuals in that situation? So in short, the question really is, is this the only feasible alternative? And if there are other ways of ensuring people's safety without locking the door, then let's do that. So that's what I'd want the authorisation process to go through. I'm happy to hand to Emma and Jane for their thoughts. Thanks, John. I, I would have answered that very, very similarly, so I don't have too much to add. And I think, um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree that um, under, under the Act, it, um, even though it's called a... Um, even though it is actually called um, a restraint door, it would not be considered actually a restrictive practice as that um, term is defined, um, unless it was used to respond to a particular um, behaviour of concern or behaviour of harm. But um, I think it's just really imperative to remember when we're talking about providing support for adults with um, impaired um, capacity with intellectual or cognitive disability that they have the same human rights as everybody else. The, um, there's um, locking a door and preventing someone from leaving clearly engages um, the right to freedom of movement. So it engages a human right that is protected by our legislation and, and both the Disability Services Act and the Human Rights Act that we've um, had for a couple of years now um, do specifically protect those human rights. So um, in my mind, the, the question is really um, about if um, if restricting those rights is reasonable and justifiable in the circumstances. So you're balancing that 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 right to freedom of movement with the um, the need for a service provider to keep a person safe. And but I think um, uh, and they're, they're both really legitimate considerations, of course. And the legislation allows um, for for limits where where they are reasonable and justifiable in the circumstances. But I think what we do too quickly is to to default to well, this is a practice that has been done before, or that we can do, or we we can apply in a blanket way without a properly nuanced consideration of the people that it's impacting and, and properly considering and turning our minds to, um, to the considerations that, that we are required to un under our Human Rights Act um, to see whether the restriction is appropriate and, and particularly here what are the less restrictive options and what opportunities are there to capacity build for the patients that do live in this facility around so that ultimately instead of restricting them we are building their capacity um, to support their own safety or to, to um, so give the support that's needed to do that in a more positive way. I would just add that what I noticed about this question was the imposition of the solution. Um, so <clears throat> whichever it is, whether it's locking the door or unlocking it, um, this was sort of a unilateral act, uh, possibly as a reaction to uh, changing policy. Uh, so yes, how could uh, a co-created solution to this policy issue, these tensions and so on, where we are listening to everybody who is in that environment and inviting them, actually inviting their creativity. What could be less restrictive? What could be um, an alternative? What, how could we build capacity and so on? So again, believing in the capacity of the people who are supporting the person, as well as the capacity of the person um, to come up with some creative solutions. I think it's a much better approach. Terrific, thank you. And yes, a, a call for uh, fresh, fresh, fresh ideas and creative thinking um, is, uh, is terrific. Natalie has asked a question in the Q&A. Uh, how are dementia locked wards considered under existing regulations? given that residents are deprived of their liberty uh, 24 hours a day. So that goes to aged care. John, might, you might be the first uh, person to respond to sure. that. Yes, assuming we're talking about residential aged care, which has this locked dementia ward. Um, well, that falls under the quality of care principles, which are national subordinate legislation, which require the approval of a restrictive practice and substitute decision maker for all of those people, if those people themselves are unable to consent. So it's a consent model. Um, as I was saying before, though, there is great lack of clarity over who can fulfil that role currently of restrictive practices, um, substitute decision maker, and it's a 
live question about whether guardians, for instance, can fulfil that role or even people, attorneys under an injury and power of attorney. That's a legal complexity that we're facing in Queensland. There also exists in other states, particularly Victoria. I don't know if Emma has anything to add to that or Jane. Um, in terms of um, under the Mental Health Act, there's quite um, an extensive um, legal regulatory regime for detaining people um, in locked mental health wards. Um, and that is there is a specific process um, provided um, under the Mental Health Act of 2016 for that. And ultimately, it comes down to um, where there's a clinical assessment of the risk um, of that the person poses to themselves or, or to others. And it's that balancing of the, again, of the restriction um, of liberty with the, um, uh, with the um, obligation to, of keeping, keeping people safe. Um, I don't think, um, my view is we haven't got that balance right in Queensland. And I think it's, um, to me, it's a really pressing human rights issue. The fact that um, both voluntary and involuntary patients are detained um, in, in locked mental health wards um, and that um, at um, there's there's a lot I could probably say about the mental health space there but I, I might see if Jane wanted to add anything rather than take too much time up. And just to sorry and see if Jane's shaking just to jump in there we would need a bit more detail about whether this is a, a mental health facility or residential aged care so we could be able to formally answer the local question. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Yolanda has posed a question and she's inviting comment from panellists about the fact that multiple NDIS participants, sorry, providers, um, they're committed to the reduction and elimination of restrictive practices. Uh, but of course, resourcing um, is an issue and there's a challenge to obtaining appropriate positive behaviour supports. So clients are really waiting for months to see a specialist practitioner. This is um, a concern that we hear a lot from um, our members uh, as QCOS. So yes, if any uh, of the panellists want to address that question, that would be terrific. I'll just jump in and just say, yes, that's a clear case of market failure in the NDIS, and this, this is a major problem. Um, and, uh, you know, it's completely right, I can just agree that um, NDIA and the NDIS Quality Safeguards Commission are very aware of this problem and are seeking to um, facilitate the growth of the market. But uh, this is this is a, a major problem uh, in, in this area, NDIS from its support. I'll pick up there if that's okay. Um, I uh, uh, yes, am glad to hear that, John. And I, the, another sort of related issue is around um, the lack of skilled support workers and incentives for working with people who are with complex behaviours. Uh, so uh, yes, this is a um, um, straight matter of resourcing in some way. And as you say, market failure, and we cannot rely on the market to care for our most vulnerable. It's an, uh, it's an outrageous proposition. Uh, and uh, yes, we need to apply um, all of the resources we possibly can to, um, to attract the right kinds of workers to build skill and capacity in practitioners and in workers. Uh, one more thing, let me see if I can retrieve it, that just crossed my mind. Uh, no, it's gone, so I'll, I'll mute myself again. And I just, I, I completely agree. I think it's a significant problem. Um, and I think it's, it's particularly prob um, a problem in areas where there are particularly thin markets. So it is something that needs to be addressed. I do also just want to note as a, as a related issue um, that even where there are positive behaviour support plans in place, they're often um, not. I think there's there's a lot of scope for improving and making those plans a, a lot more. I, th I think using some of the um, terrific insights that James shared about properly listening to people and um, making sure that they really are reflecting strategies that are going to work for the person that are individualized because I think sometimes we see these plans and ultimately they're not effective even when they are in place. Yes thank you Emma that reminded me of what I had lost was that yes what resources are available to you now while you are waiting for that specialist practitioner 
Let's not only rely on outside expertise for something that is deeply personal and complex and that actually the people who are working every day or living every day with this person will have incredible insights to offer in this space. Uh, specialist practitioners are not going to solve this for us. Let's not externalize it. Let's own it and share it and be in partnership in responding. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to acknowledge Fran Vickery's comment, both in the chat and the Q&A, just, um, just stating and clarifying that locked gates, doors and windows are environmental restraints and it is considered a restrictive practice in terms of uh, NDIS participants. Yes, John. Yeah, and indeed, Fran, Fran's right in terms of reporting to the NDIS Commission um, and complying with the NDIS rules, but, but of course, the lock, they don't require authorisation under the state legislation, which is the point that we we're making before. So Fran's entirely right in terms of reporting those as restrictive practices. That's right. But another great way of teasing out that fragmentation uh, and inconsistency that we uh, are trying to navigate. Uh, Emily's got a great question, um, inviting the panel to, um, and this probably again to you perhaps first, John, um, how do you foresee the senior practitioner authorisation model being applied in the child protection sector and in particular out of home care? Yes, yeah, so I just, I'll try and be brief here, I just think it ought to be, and it can be. There's a question, in fact, what Jane was just saying a minute ago, one of Jane's observations earlier, which is all, all things that I, that I don't like to call behaviours of concern, um, it's a form of communication. Uh, these are all forms of communication. So bearing that in mind, there are, there are a couple of ways in which a senior practitioner authorisation model can work where you, you have an independent statutory officer who is a senior practitioner and they can, in the Victorian ACT models, they can authorise either in the ACT, it's a panel in Victoria, it's an uh, authorised programme officer who are in the organisation, the disability service themselves, who um, they are authorised to use a restrictive practice where it's in um, been written up in a behaviour support plan and so on, where there is expertise at the local level, that could be crafted into the out-of-home child protection system. The other way of doing it is to have everyone kind of based in the office of the senior practitioner at arm's length from the service provider. The challenge you have with that model, so there you have independence, but the problem is you often don't know the person to get into Jane's point. So that's some of the challenge that needs to be teased out and we won't have the time here to work that through in the child protection space other than to say it could apply there. We need a, a way of ensuring that there is that child protection expertise, but also a central body, and I would say, the senior practitioner at state level, we can oversee and have a clear authorisation framework. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we are at time, so uh, I now want to bring our discussion to a close. Uh, and I, as I'm doing that, I think there'll be a, poll, a very short poll appearing on people's uh, screen. So um, I invite you to just you know, click the buttons for that. Um, but I just really uh, have to acknowledge and thank our speakers for their time today. I think Queensland is in a better place for the enduring passion, commitment and advocacy um, of people like you, Emma, Jane, your, your lifetime of advocacy is um, invaluable in informing the discussion for, for a future um, that is more respective of human rights in this difficult space of restrictive practices. And John, we are very lucky to have you here in Queensland uh, in the Office of Public Advocate. Thank you so very much. Thank you to our audience. You've been really great. There have been some fantastic questions coming through um, on this really hugely important topic. And um, that's it. The, the final thing to say is don't forget to follow us on all of our various social channels. We have Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, not yet TikTok. Uh, so I don't think we're cool enough for that. Um, I wish everybody uh, a really good rest of the week. Stay well and thanks again. Thanks, Monica. Bye. Thanks, Monica. Thanks all.